Well, it's a great honor for me to present three Cardinals and the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States. Cardinal Justin Regali, Cardinal William Leveda, and Cardinal Stanislaw Zivich, and Archbishop Christophe Pierre. And also we have Father Tomas, who is the translator and assistant and former uh, secretary when the Cardinal was the Archbishop of Krakow. Now he's the Emeritus. Cardinal Regali, as you all know, um, our own Cardinal. That's what the plaque says over there, Knoxville's own Cardinal. Former Archbishop of St. Louis. <laughs> former Archbishop of Philadelphia. He worked in Rome for many years, translator to Pope Paul, the, or soon to be, God willing, St. Paul VI. Uh, John Paul I, he was with him all those days that he was Pope that month. And John Paul II, and Congregation for the Bishops, uh, and the uh, president of the Pontifical Academy, Ecclesiastical Academy, the diplomatic school for the, for the church. We have Cardinal William Leveda, who is the former Archbishop of Portland. Former Archbishop of San Francisco, he worked in Rome very closely with Cardinal Ratzinger. When Cardinal Ratzinger was elected Pope uh, as Pope Benedict XVI, it was Cardinal Leveda who took his place as the prefect for the doctrine of the faith, which basically is the theologian of the Catholic Church. And so we're grateful to have him here as well. Now, yesterday, I made a huge mistake at the Mass. I forgot to introduce the nuncio. <laughs> it's the, the nuncio, um, Christophe Pierre. He was former nuncio in Mexico, in Haiti, Uganda, and in other diplomatic services. Now, in the last couple years, he's been the nuncio to the United States. What is the nuncio? The nuncio is the ambassador from the Holy See, the Vatican, the Pope, to a country as well as the representative of the Holy Father to that particular Catholic nature of the country. So he has been, uh, so he lives on Embassy Row right across the street from the Vice President's residence. Um, and uh, I'm sure he finds Washington interesting these days, huh? So we're so honored to have him. And as you know, the focus tonight will be on um, the co-patron of the diocese and a man of great holiness who was Pope for over 26 years. Um, Cardinal Zivish was with him um, from the time Cardinal Wojtyla was the Archbishop of Krakow. And then when he was elected, surprise, surprise, he became uh, the secretary to the Holy Father, uh, the future sta saint. And so we were so privileged. And in a very particular way, in my life, I have this strong devotion to two saints, a lot of saints, St. Joseph, always, and it's, it's ironic, the Pope's middle name was Joseph, Joseph, uh, but also to Pope St. John Paul II. And to have Cardinal Zivish with us here in the Diocese of Knoxville is a tremendous honor, I think, for all of us, but also in a very particular way for myself. So Stanislaw Cardinal Zivish. So, if I mess up tonight, I, I am in danger because I have someone I live with, someone who has great relationships with a saint, someone who is in charge of the doctrine of the faith, and the nuncio. <laughs> so please pray for me, will you? Yeah, yeah. And the first question I was going to ask, and Father Thomas, so um, we're going to have to work through this a little bit. Um, but as you know, and, and part of this, my conversation about um, um, Karno Zivish is the fact that I, I took a lot of it from a book that he wrote. It's a great book. I recommend it. My Life with Carol. The Pope's real first name was Carol Joseph Wojtyla, born in 1920 in Wadowice, Poland. And so, Eminence, you were born in, is it right if I say this, what year? 1939, before World War II, you know, World War II started with the invasion to Poland of the, of G the Germans, September 1st, 1939. Cardinal was born before that, but do you have any remembrances of the occupation, both of the, the, the Nazis as well as with the communists, of course? 
What does that do when you're young to know that you're an occupied person, a country? Na początku chciałem bardzo serdecznie podziękować księdzu biskupowi za zaproszenie, a także za zorganizowanie tego spotkania tu w katedrze na zajutrz po konsekracji. First, I would like to thank uh, His Excellency Bishop Stika for inviting us to be here and for organizing this special event tonight, right after the consecration of this great cathedral. Ja poznałem wcześniej księdza biskupa, ale tutaj to moje poznanie pogłębiło się i widzę, że jest znakomitym pasterzem i fajnym biskupem. I knew him before, but uh, this time when I came, he came here, I had this uh, opportunity to know him even better. So I, so I know that now I know that he's a great pastor, great shepherd of the diocese and a cool bishop. I like this guy. Gotcha. Bardzo serdecznie pozdrawiam wszystkich zgromadzonych. Bardzo Wam dziękuję za taką życzliwą odpowiedź na słowa księdza biskupa i teraz na parę słów moich. I greet you all present here and thank you for this warm welcome of the words from your bishop and, uh, and welcoming my opinion about him. I'm a cool bishop. Tak sobie myślałem, że o tej porze w mojej ojczyźnie zgromadzić, a takie spotkanie nie byłoby łatwo. A tu się udało. I was thinking, uh, entering in the, in the cathedral tonight, that in my homeland, in Poland, it would be difficult to gather so many people at Sunday night, and you made it here. Urodziłem się. As uh, Bishop mentioned, I was born right before the Second World War in 19... 39. So I don't remember much from the time of war, but I remember one thing. Our family at that time was very poor because it was, uh, Poland was occupied by Germany, by Germans, and uh, we, uh, everything was missing. We were, uh, uh, there was a hunger, but uh, people were really poor. But I remember that my family, my parents, they welcomed they gave shelter to a young Jewish man who was looking for shelter, who was looking for rescue. And they did it because they were Christians. They, they were inspired by Christian love. They, they knew that there, if there is a man in need, he needs to be helped, he needs to be rescued. And that's why they welcomed him in our house. Może 400 metrów od mojego domu były siostry uszulaki szare, czarne. I one też przechowywały u siebie Żydówki. Przebierały also, je not far from zakonne. our house, there was a house of sisters, of nuns. And also them were rescuing Jewish girls. They were giving them their habits, their vestments, so they can pretend, they could pretend they were nuns, they were sisters, even though they were not baptized. And they were teaching them some Christian words, Christian expressions, prayers, so that they can pretend in case of intervention of secret German police that they are really nuns. But there was someone who betrayed them and uh, and the Germans learned about this and they imprisoned all of them, all the nuns, and the superior was then sent to Auschwitz, to the concentration camp, and then she died there. And so these are my, my memories from the time of war, and I would like to finish here because I know that Bishop Stiga has many, many, many questions. You know, they always talk about the seminary, the first seminary is the home. And it just shows in Cardinal Jivish's life, his vocation was nurtured 
at home because he witnessed mercy and he witnessed kindness and care for another person regardless of what faith. So his first seminary professors were his parents. And that's why it's so important for all of you who have children or grandchildren to nurture by example vocations so that we have more priests like these fine men who are up here today. Now I'm going to ask Archbishop Christophe Pierre, why did you become a, you know, he's in the diplomatic service. So he has spent most of his priesthood being trained to represent the Holy Father and the church in country after country. Many countries that are not a huge, maybe Catholic population, or countries like Haiti or Uganda who have faith, uh, faced great difficulties. So we were talking earlier, he wanted to be a parish priest, probably like all of us, but God had other plans. Why did you become a priest? Uh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> how, how, could you, how could I answer to that? You know, I remember some, uh, I'm from a big family, so I have uh, a lot of uh, brothers and sisters, and uh, now a lot of nephews and grandnephews. So some years ago, <clears throat> I happened to, to, to spend a weekend in a family house. I, am the, I was the only adult with a tribe of teenagers. I don't know if you know what teenagers are. <laughs> they invest in a different way. They behave in a different way. The, all my, there was about 10 nephews and nieces, and all uh, about 15, 13, 15. So I was the only adult. And it was a very, very interesting experience. I was already a priest. I was already a bishop, by the way. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm, when the, your nephews are small, they are not very interested by who you are. But when they grow up, they begin to ask questions. And as we were together for two or three days, at some stage, uh, one of uh, one niece said, but by the way, uh, Christophe, when, uh, when did you become a priest? When did you enter into the seminary? And uh, because I said, well, I entered in a seminary when I finished secondary school, when I was 17. 17? That's not possible. You had not lived. <laughs> I said, what, what do you mean? You know, because they, of course they were about near 17, so they could not imagine uh, to, to take such a decision. You know that many young people today, I don't know, I don't speak about Knoxville. You know, Knoxville is quite different, yeah? <laughs> but uh, many young people today, it takes a lot of time. You know, I have still nephews and nieces today. They are 25, 25 26, and they're still, they are still hesitating if they will get married. They have their friends, their girlfriends, but when will you marry? Ah, wait a little bit, you know, and uh, so they don't know exactly what they will do. So I said, at 17, I take the decision to enter into the major seminary. But you had not lived. It, so that was, uh, and then I, I began to, we began to have a very interesting conversation. I said, well, first and foremost, you know, I had lived a lot before, and I was able to explain them uh, the family. You ask me, why did you become a priest? I think uh, <clears throat> I, have, I have had a lot of friends who became priests because they, had, they, 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 they met a, a very nice priest, you know, kind of modern priest. But my vocation was not a clonation of a priest. <laughs> yeah, that means that I've never had really a priest as a model. I knew a lot of priests because in my family, priests were welcome at home but I never wanted to imitate a priest. But my vocation came from a, a family atmosphere. I think it's, it has been very important. You know, the transmission of the faith was through my father, my mother, uh, who are lay people. My vocation as a priest came from lay people. It was not an imitation of a priest. Because this, in my family, I had two lay people committed in the society. My father was a lawyer, a bit of a politician. My mother was very committed in the society and the church. And uh, I, as, as soon as I was able to, to realize things, I 
witness people who are trying to live their faith in their daily life. For example, I would never imagine my father be becoming an uh, extraordinary minister of the communion. That was outside my imagination. But my father, as a lawyer, as a politician, was, first of all, he was a man of prayer, a man of God, and very committed into the society. And that's where I learned the, what is Christian life. And my mother, the same, well, in different way. And the family was a place where we tried to, 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 there was a place of presence of God. It was a small church. I learned the church in my family, and from my family, we, I discovered the church, the parish, in the movements, the scouts, and so forth. And from that experience, uh, was born in my heart and uh, the desire to become a priest. Well, oh, that, you know, it's interesting as you were speaking, I'm thinking how you four are connected because this is how it works, I think. Cardinal Regali worked for the Congregation of Bishops. A diocese would open up. Then, eventually, paperwork wound up on the desk of the Pope. And then from that, he was informed, he informed through the Congregation of Bishops, a nuncio, who would then call somebody up and change their life forever. <laughs> and this is how it is. The Holy Father would like you to be. Cardinal Levada, do you remember when you got your first their phone call? Was your first diocese Portland or something before? Uh, well, I was a I was auxiliary bishop in Los Angeles for three years uh, before going to Portland. And uh, it was uh, as auxiliary bishop that I was informed that uh, the Holy Father, Pope John Paul, had uh, decided that I was to become one of the new auxiliary bishops in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Who was the nuncio that called you? The, well, it, was my, it wasn't the nuncio. In those days, oh. it, it, when you were an auxiliary bishop, it was the bishop of the diocese who was informed and asked to inform you. And then to call that you were to you were supposed to tell him whether you agreed or not, and then he would call the nuncio back. And I was on a uh, business trip uh, for the Conference of Bishops of California. He was playing golf, actually. And no, actually, the Archbishop was playing golf. And oh! <laughs> so I was told by his secretary that uh, I could I could reach him at 8:30 in the evening. I had a 9:30 flight from Los Angeles back to Pittsburgh uh, when I a red eye. So I called him from the uh, from a payphone in the baggage claim area, there were no other people around there, and I said, Archbishop, uh, your sec I got a call from your secretary that you wanted to speak to me, and he said to call you at this hour. And he said, um, Bill, are you alone? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked around and I said, uh, yes, sir, uh, there's nobody around, I'm at a payphone. And so he told me of the, the news, and, uh, uh, and uh, it was, uh, I, I mean, it was, astonishing to me uh, and uh, I had a very wakeful night on that plane going back to Pittsburgh he said call me tomorrow and let me know <laughs> that you've assented to this so I can tell the nuncio and he can tell the Holy what Father. What year was that? That was in 1983. So you were in the congregation what years? From 19... I was in the congregation from 1990 to 1994. Okay well then he didn't have anything to do with you becoming a bishop. No, but no, see what you did, no, you no, would do later it. on? A guy was having a good time, enjoying himself, and then all of a sudden he gets a phone call, he calls the, then the nuncio is informed, and it's all because of you, because you were working with John Paul. <laughs> you see, the Holy Spirit is a part of our lives. And sometimes in places you at least expect it to be, want to be a priest of Los Angeles and also and then be informed by your archbishop that you were going to be sent to Rome or stay in Rome because of the Vatican Council. Another time you're the secretary to an archbishop, you go to Rome for the election of a pope and then all of a sudden the archbishop's the pope, huh? And then we got Cardinal Levada, who's minding in his own business, became the auxiliary, goes to Portland, goes to San Francisco, imagine that, goes to San Francisco and eventually works with Pope Benedict and takes his place. And we got the nuncio who was enjoying himself in France. <laughs> and today he's in Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> when, I, 
When I was appointed bishop, it just showed me that God has a sense of humor. <laughs> so, Cardo Jivish, I was wondering how you felt when you heard Habemus Papum, uh, Cardinal Voitia. What did that do to your heart? People, some people, and also in the newspapers, uh, Karol Wojtyla as Archbishop of Krakow and the Cardinal, he was taken into consideration as a candidate for future Pope, so it was not um, like that nobody was considering it. But still it was a, uh, also in Vatican, there, there, there were people who say that he would be a good Pope. But still it was a great surprise when uh, we heard his name uh, being there at St. Peter's Square. And um, it shook me, it was shocking for me because I was aware that he will have a great burden on his shoulders now because he will need to take care um, of the whole Catholic Church. We were speaking here about uh, natural family, but there is a uh, spiritual family, which is which is a holy Catholic Church that is uniting people from all over the world, different races, different nations. And one of the tasks of the Pope is to unite the whole Church. So it was a great burden for him, and I was aware of that. No, I was just asking the Cardinal to stop because I, I need to translate. <laughs> I know from Cardinal Wyszyński, he told me that right after the election, after the conclave, John Paul II was a bit afraid of how he, will be, he would be welcomed by the people of Rome, people of Italy, after so many years so many, so many ages of popes that were Italian, and here there would be a Pope that is not Italian and even from in a communist country. But very soon, very soon this anxiety, this, uh, this fear of John Paul II was over because uh, when he started to talk from the window, when he, uh, where he appeared after the election, very quickly he could feel that he had this special relationship with Roman people, especially after this, um, his famous phrase where, where he said, I will speak yours, our language, and if I make a mistake, you will, you will correct me, you will, you will tell me how, how to speak it better. And uh, even though he was not supposed to speak at that time, this uh, short speech, uh, was uh, very, uh, it started a great relationship with the Roman people. And people in the Vatican were aware that he will govern because the, the MC was uh, told him not to speak, that there is only a blessing, no speech. But he started to do what he wanted to do. So they were aware immediately that he will govern the church, really. Cardinal Levada, do you remember? Well, you were a bishop already then, huh? No, I, no? Was, I was a priest working in the Vatican at the okay. time. And uh, like Sister Timothea in the, uh, in the uh, video that we saw, uh, once the news came out that white smoke had gone up, you dropped everything and went to the, went to the uh, Piazza San Pietro. And the, ma uh, the mass of people I saw standing over a few, this is going to be a little footnote about uh, the reception, the, the initial impact of the election of a non-Italian pope after 450 years. And so I went over to stand next to this priest who was my immediate superior, the undersecretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, where I worked among the officials in the doctrine section. And he was standing there, and so we were chatting while we were waiting for the curtains to part and, uh, and the uh, announcement to come. And uh, so uh, just to set the scene, this was a difficult time in, in Italy. They had a very active terrorist, local terrorist group called the Red Brigades, who were responsible for many killings of politicians, among them uh, a wonderful prime minister named Aldo Moro, who went very, very close to Pope Paul uh, the Sixth. And so I was, we were standing chatting, and I, when, it, when the Cardinal came out to announce the um, name, he didn't have a very good pronunciation, as I recall, of Wojtyla. Uh, and I, so I asked him, I said, I, I couldn't, I had got the Carolum in Latin, and I thought, well, there is uh, Carol, Carol, 
uh, Carol Canfolonieri, this ancient uh, Italian priest. I couldn't. So I asked Montina Bovoni. I said, uh, who is it? Who is it? He said, è un polacco. He's a Polish guy. He said, and, and it just went on. And this one of was God's a, a, chosen ones. J j just a, just a, a, a kind of a creed occur. He said, primo moro adesso questo povera Italia. He said, first moral, now this, poor Italy. <laughs> uh, now, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it, it is, I, I remembered it, it's actually, but it was, a, it was a spontaneous reaction of a wonderfully dedicated gentleman of the church, but also a son of Italy who thought, what's going to happen to us now that we've lost, we've, ha we've had this prime minister assassinated, and now we've lost the pope. And soon after he died. <laughs> not so soon. Eminenza, not so soon. Um, uh, Bovone lived long enough to become a cardinal as prefect of the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith. However, he received his red hat in Gemelli Hospital a few days before he died of cancer. But he was a great, great churchman. And this was just a spontaneous reaction because uh, I think we saw in Sister Timothy a, a, a spontaneous, we were so happy to see that this Pope uh, was a, came from, the, from Eastern Europe and there were so many wonderful things about that, uh, positive things. But uh, just to get the feel for how this was received in Italy and how the Pope must have thought, how is this going to be received by the Curia, Ro uh, Roman Curia and so forth? Well. We all can know that he was received in a most spectacular uh, way for the great gifts that he brought to the church. When I was a, a kid, um, no, I wasn't a kid, I was in college. I was at St. Louis University working, and uh, I drove home and the radio was on and they said the white smoke had come out, so I went home and I went into the house and my parents had the TV turned on. That's when they only had four or five channels, remember? And uh, all of a sudden they announced Car Carol Vortia and they said a Polish, uh, Polish Pope. And then uh, within minutes, somebody was pounding on our front door. It was a neighbor, Francis Slay, whose son eventually was elected four times as mayor of the city of St. Louis. Francis was Lebanese, but his wife's maiden name was Sobosinski. And he, my mom answered the door and he said, they have elected a Polish man as the Pope. And he was proud. But the, the story was, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Italians are now in second place. <laughs> But I'm just curious, uh, Karnojevich, the first time you saw Pope John Paul II in that white cassock, it must have really touched your heart. Or maybe gave you some heartburn. <laughs> so my, my first uh, meeting with the new Pope was during the conclave, it was still formally, uh, it was not over yet formally. And then there was a dinner of the new Pope, John Paul II, with the Cardinals, and someone asked the, at that time Monsignor Jivish to, to come for, uh, to see the new Pope. And as always, John Paul II welcomed him very cordially, he hugged him, and he told to Don Stanislaw, look what they did to me. I mean, can you imagine the change in the life of Cardinal Jivish here he was, the secretary to an archbishop of a very large archdiocese. I served with Cardinal Regali in St. Louis. And then the next minute, he finds out, or eventually he finds out, he's moving from Poland to Rome. His boss has a little, a certain sense of infallibility, you know, not that he invoked it, but a radical change not only for St. John Paul, but a, a radical change for Monsignor Stanislaw. You know, I asked him what the Pope called him, and he said, Stash? Si. <laughs> I, Cardinal Regali calls me Rick, so I guess it's the same thing. <laughs> Cardinal Regali, as you know, served with three popes. He served very closely with Blessed Paul VI, and rumor has it that he will be canonized by Pope Francis before the uh, end of the year. Paul VI was a long-suffering Pope, because he was the Pope in the 60s when so much of the world was changing. And he issued this wonderful document, Humanae Vitae, 
which kind of predicted what was going to happen into the future. And many, many people turned away from him because they said he was, he was out of touch. And now we're seeing many of the things that are in that beautiful document, Humana Vitae, about how we treat life are, are coming to pass. But I know Cardinal Regali worked very closely with Paul VI. He was with St. John Paul, or not St. John Paul, uh, Pope John Paul I, you know, he was Pope for 33, uh, and he was with him every day of that time, most days. And my favorite story of Cardinal Regali is that I think it was the last day the Pope John Paul I called him up to his office n a number of times. And uh, at one point, maybe the last contact, he apologized for disturbing Monsignor Regali so much. And he said to, to now Cardinal Regali that he was sorry disturbed Monsignor. We all know what that connotation is, huh? <laughs> and a few years ago at our Eucharistic Congress, I said, well, he said he was a disturbed Monsignor and popes are infallible. <laughs> Do you remember where you were when it was announced that Carol Voitia would be the new pope? Yes, I was on the, one of the side balconies of the Vatican. There were two of us, Cardinal Ray, Giovanni Battista Ray, and I, we were on, the, on this, the side balcony, and it was there that we, we got the announcement. See, so those are, those are great memories. Um, there's so many questions. I told Cardinal Jeevish that I could just stay with him for months because I love history, as you might know, and I love Cardinals, as you know. <laughs> Baseball, and, uh, and, and there's so much. But one of the questions I was just curious about also, as a, as a priest who worked with an archbishop, when, remember seeing on TV when uh, President Gorbachev visited Pope John Paul at the Vatican, and that was after the uh, assassination attempt years later, and a lot of people thought that maybe the Soviet Union had something to do with that because communism was cracking and wasn't able to succeed. And John Paul was a threat to that, that, gov that type of government that was so um, horrible to people that the, the state was greater than the person. And I was just curious, because Karno Zivish was in that area, what it was like to see the, the president of the Soviet Union or the, the, the chief of the party come to the Vatican and to acknowledge John Paul as an important role, important person in the world. I, I would like to start with uh, by saying that from the very beginning, right after the election, the communists in Moscow and in Warsaw were very much afraid of John Paul II and they didn't know how to announce the news, what to do with it, because they were aware that he knew communism very well, he was aware of weaknesses of the system and they were very much afraid of that. Uh, there was uh, one communist official in Krakow when Karl was Archbishop of Krakow was going to conclave. They told him this. Uh, this official, he told him, okay, he, he told about him, okay, let him go to Rome. But when he comes back, we'll we'll talk to him. But he never came back. And it was not easy for him to to have this pilgrimage, this first pilgrimage to Poland. Um, after the first pilgrimage to Mexico, then it was accepted um, by the communist government in Poland to invite and to have Pope John Paul II in Poland. But it was not easy. I would just want to mention the assassination attempt. It was shocking for everybody because nobody would expect that there would be such a thing in St. Peter's Square, in the very heart of Vatican. Um, but from the very beginning, right after the assassination attempt, there were many voices, many people were convinced that the order, the decision must have been taken in Moscow and that Ali Akcha was only hired to do this. When John Paul II was in Jameli Hospital after the assassination attempt, he realized very quickly that the day of this uh, 
attempt. It was 13th of May, which is the, the feast of commemoration of Our Lady of Fatima. And he started to investigate the revelations uh, of Our Lady of Fatima. And he asked uh, about the third Fatima secret. And the documents were brought to him from the congregations of the doctrine of faith. And Our Lady of Fatima was asking that Russia is to be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart. That was part of the message of Our Lady from Fatima. And John Paul II realized that he needs to do it really. And after some time, even though it was not easy, he did it. He did it on St. Peter's Square. There was the original statue of Our Lady of Fatima brought from Portugal to Rome. And he did this act of consecration of communist Russia to Immaculate Heart of Our Lady. In 1981, it was a beautiful May day, the feast of Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, Carter Bergali was in St. Peter's Square because it was a day of an audience. I mean, it's, I know it's probably a painful thing to remember, but as you saw in that video, um, the Holy Father had just embraced the child, huh? And he gave the child back to the mother, and then you could see video of a gun, of a gun. And who would have thought in the Pope's backyard that his life would be almost taken? I can't imagine what it must have been for you, as you were so close to the Holy Father, like a father he was to you, to have him fall into your arms. And I'm sure those moments are printed on your, on your memory. At the moment, right after the attempt, there was no time for thinking. We needed to rea react immediately. And uh, it, it was providential that we decided not to go, not to bring Pope to his apartment, but go straight to, to the hospital. Because, because if, it was, if he was brought to the, the, his apartment, he would surely die because he was sh shot. And the loss of blood was so intense that he lost consciousness very quickly. But I remember going with him uh, in the ambulance that before he lost conscience, he was praying for a very... Um, in a very low voice, but already then he forgave the person who, even though he was not aware of who it was, but already then he forgave the person who tried to kill him, and he offered this suffering for the good of Catholic Church. And there were difficult moments also during the intervention, during the operation after the assassination attempt. There was a moment when um, Dr. Buzonetti came to me and told me that we need to anoint uh, John Paul II because he's really losing life, losing pressure, and uh, the heart is really very, very weak. So it was a very difficult moment for me to do the service to John Paul II. And, but Thank, thank to God he was saved from this and, and we would need to thank Our Lady of Fatima for that. But now, I remember, we need to go back to Gorbachev. After this act of consecration of the communist countries, especially communist Russia, to Immaculate Heart of Our Lady uh, that I mentioned before, there were bishops from Eastern Europe coming to Rome and they were saying to Pope John Paul II that after this act, they could feel that changes started in this region of the world. And that's how I see also this first visit of this of, uh, communist Russian uh, leader in Vatican and his first me meeting with Pope. I see it also as a fruit of this act of consecration. Gorbachev, Gorbachev confessed to admit it to John Paul II that for a long time he was studying the social, social doctrine of church, especially the documents by John Paul II. And he was aware, seeing also the crisis and the weaknesses of Marxism and communism in Russia and other communist countries, he was aware that he needed to do something about it because he was aware of this crisis and changes that were going in a bad direction. And 
He admitted that partly with this idea of perestroika, of the changes in the communist world, he was inspired by social teaching of John Paul II. And also during this first visit, Gorbachev was very much insisting on John Paul II to go to Moscow to visit Russia. He really want, he was inviting the Pope to, to visit uh, communist Russia. And in response, John Paul II said that, of, of course, he's always invited by heads of state, but officially he only goes to countries where he's invited by the local church. Is it Catholic or Orthodox Church? You know, we all know about redemptive suffering. You know, to offer something up. I remember when I was in grade school, the sisters would always say, you know, your life's being, you feel miserable, and the sisters would always say, well, offer it up. You see the power of offering it up. John Paul, when he was shot, offered it up for the world. Redemptive suffering. And, uh, is, do you think, you know, John Paul was a great man of intense prayer, but as he increased in age and, and wisdom, huh, they say he became a mystic, that he had that unique and special connection with God. Do you think with the assassination attempt, did you see a change in the Pope's prayer life in his connection to the Lord? I must say that uh, he appreciated the, uh, the worth of uh, prayer, not when he became a priest, a bishop, or a pope. He learned about it already as a little boy. He had a great example of his father, a man of prayer, a military. But he would always see every night uh, his father praying. So he discovered this even before he became priest, bishop, and then pope. Uh, but the second aspect of his life was suffering. It was not only the assassination attempt, but the suffering was present in his life uh, through, through all his life. Even when he was little or then a young uh, man, he, during war he was hit by a German truck, he lost conscience. And uh, of course, when he got older, it was more intense, but suffering was always present in his life. But he would always say that, uh, that suffering has, has its sense that uh, Christ saved the world through the cross, and that's how we can uh, save the world by our suffering united with uh, uh, suffering Christ. You know, one of the things... Um, and, oh yes, I oh, missed sorry. it. And he would never complain. Cardinal said that he never heard John Paul II complaining, even when he was suffering very strongly. One of the, if you look at YouTube, there are thousands of videos of the Pope, especially when he would interact with young people. He had this great and intense relationship, even as he aged, with the great respect that, that he had for the young and the young had for him. It was this wonderful, wonderful uh, attraction. Uh, did he have a sense of humor? Yes, he had great sense of humor and he enjoyed laughing. There's a great story, and thank God, goodness, the, uh, the Cardinal validated it. Um, it is said that the Holy Father, as he aged, as we all do a bit, he gained a little weight, and he had a sweet tooth. And I found out he also liked coffee. So the, the sisters who took care of his household were trying to get him to lose weight, or at least to avoid the sweets. And apparently, there was this interaction between one of the sisters and the Holy Father that when, it was, when he wanted a cookie, he would begin to do a circle on the table. And you said that's true. Uh, yes, it's true, I confirm it, because he would never ask, he would never use the words to ask for that, but he had his signs with the sisters, because I, I have to say that he really didn't care what he was eating, he would eat anything, he would never... But there were two things that he really enjoyed, that he really liked, cookies and coffee. Just think if he had one of those coffee shops. What's, what's the coffee shop everyone goes to? Yeah, if that was in the Vatican, he would be pretty high strung, I guess, huh? <laughs> the, um, the other thing about Pope John Paul was, why do you think as he aged, the young adults still had a connection to him with World Youth Day?
Jan Paweł II. It's true that he had this good contact with young people already when he was a young priest. He uh, was always trusting young, young people. Um, he knew, he was aware that young people are very sensitive to what is right, what is beautiful, what is really true. And that young people are looking for answers. They are asking questions. And he wanted to respond to these questions. And in my opinion, that, that's the, the key point of uh, his relationship with young people. This trust and this will to respond to their questions. He was demanding, he was leading them, but he was always doing it with, uh, with love and respect. And young people were aware of that. They knew that he wanted really good for them. Colonel is underlining that, that he was demanding, but uh, young people knew that it's something really good for them, that he wants good for them, he really loves them. I heard a phone, was that God calling? <laughs> we're going to kind of tie this up a little bit soon, uh, but Carter Regali, um, how do you teach the faith to young adults? Well, I think Pope John Paul II gives us a wonderful example. One of, the, one of the components, and a very, very important part of the component of communicating the faith is that the one that is doing it has to show his or her interest and love for the people he's communicating the faith to. I remember once <clears throat> Cardinal Jeevish and I were with Pope John Paul II on his trip to Ireland. It was the first English-speaking uh, trip that he made in 1979. It was actually the third, it was the third international trip. But anyway, he made this long trip to Ireland and the United States in September, October, 1979. And one of the memories I have which was, which was marvelous. When we were in Ireland, we were in, on Galway Bay, and the venue was the venue for young people. Of course, there were many other people there, but it, I think it was something like 300,000. Dublin had a, had a million, but 300,000 there on Galway Bay. And the Pope spoke to the young people. And during that talk, I, I kept chart, I kept uh, track. He was actually applauded 42 times, 42 times in his talk. But the 41st time, that was something special because the applause began. Now, a, a minute is a long time. And he went over it. Five minutes, it never happens. And he went over it. And 10 minutes is impossible, and he went over it. It was 12 and a half minutes, but he said something that the young people liked. They liked it so much they applauded for 12 and a half minutes. The applause died down, and then they began to, they took it up again. John Paul II, we love you. But what did he say? What did he say? Which was, meant so much to them. He was communicating the message, but he did it and he says, young people of Ireland, I love you. I love you. Twelve and a half minutes. It was fabulous. It was fabulous. I can remember they used to chant, JP2, we love you. And there's a, a YouTube where it's, he says it to them, JP2, he loves you. And it would, go, it would go back and forth, and you can see the connection. See, it's about connection. Faith is about connecting. And, and you, you just saw that, and you witnessed it with Pope John Paul. You know, the Cardinal was talking about how he offered his suffering up for the church and for the world. And I think young people are a lot of times more aware than us old folks, huh? I'm 60, so I guess I could say a little bit. You know, we get, we get touched by baggage of experience. Some good and some not so good. But they saw in John Paul authenticity. Authenticity in his suffering 
that he never gave up. And I remember in those last months, um, when you saw this man, even when he traveled, I think his last international trip was, was it to Lourdes or Fatima? It was Lourdes, huh? When they... No. Ultima. Sì. Ho stati a Podrugba de Lourdes. The uh, Cardinal has conf confirmed that the, the, the last trip to, to Lourdes, together with other uh, um, ill people, weak people, it was to Lourdes. And after the passing of the Holy Father, when he went to the house of the Father, as Cardinal Sandri said, um, they said when his body was in, in St. Peter's, a million people were standing in line, waiting just to pass quickly by the body of the Holy Father. You know, one of the reasons I'm so grateful that Cardinal Jeevish is here is he exemplifies the spirit of Pope John Paul. You know how they always say, you know, when you have a good friend, you begin to think like them and you, you know how they are. And so, you know, these years now since the death of the Holy Father, since his beatification, since his, his canonization, um, St. Paul, John Paul the Great, the spirit is carried with Cardinal Jeevish. And I am just so grateful that he said yes. Uh, to travel to Knoxville, little old diocese of Knoxville. You know, from here he goes to Chicago, which is a little bit bigger, and then he goes to Detroit, which is a little bit bigger. But we are so honored, Your Eminence, that you are with us today uh, to, to give us for that tremendous gift of the, of the stole that will be eventually displayed here, for the relic that's now in the altar here in the cathedral. But in the name of the people of God, uh, to all of you, to, to the Archbishop, the Nuncio, um, the work that you do, is tremendous because you are the physical face in so many different ways, the spirit of the Holy Father now, Pope Francis, you represent him. Cardinal Levada, your life of service to the church, um, both as a, as a priest, as a bishop, as an archbishop, as a prefect working for the good of the church. Cardinal Regali, my buddy, he's gotta get to heaven without going to purgatory because he has to live with me. The, the definition of a martyr is somebody who has to live with a sticker. <laughs> but I just want to thank the four of you, Father Tomas. Please pray for them. And Your Eminence, you have a very special connection to St. John Paul because you knew him so well. Please pray for us here in the Diocese of Knoxville. We need the prayers. Bardzo dziękuję za te słowa. Piękne. Chociaż to chciałbym Thank you for all these beautiful uh, words that you said, Your Excellency, to Cardinal Jivish. Um, he would like to follow, Cardinal says, I would like to follow John Paul II, but it's not always easy to follow a saint. It's a, it's a difficult task. But uh, Cardinal, uh, to summarize, he, he uh, wanted to say that the last words from John Paul II before he died uh, was the consecration of the church and of the world to divine mercy. Uh, this is my advice for you. Um, if you have any difficult situation, any issues, um, requests to God, we have a great protector, great intercessor, which is uh, St. John Paul II. And I do it myself. I have to testify. I have to testify. Um, I tell him, Holy Father, I was serving you faithfully for 39 years. Now it's your turn to help me. <laughs> and it's always working. We had this, uh, for example, last uh, two years ago, we had the World Youth Days in Krakow, and we were worried about security, about terrorism, and about weather. And we uh, entrusted all of it to John Paul II. We prayed to, through his intercession, and it worked out very, very well, perfectly. So we're gonna close this evening. Um, how, does this sound good? We'll, we'll chant the Our Father, the prayer of Jesus, and then invite the Cardinals and the Archbishop to give us their blessing, and that'll be it. And that will conclude our dedication weekend. You know, we have many activities over the next months uh, here at the cathedral to celebrate uh, this, this great gift that all of you have given to each other as the Mother Church of the Diocese. But...